Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my webcam so that I don't, um, my video doesn't cover up any of the slides, but I'll turn it on at the end during the question and answer period. So I'm going to stop sharing that now. Um, Chip, just chime in if I happen to not see a question that comes in or someone has their hands raised. Um, just let me know if, if there are any questions um, or we'll if there's any on. other tech, if there's any other technical issues, Chip. Okay, we'll do the questions at the end. That way you can get into a flow. That sounds good. Thanks. All right. Well, my name is Nate Batchelor, and I'm a research fishery biologist with the uh, National Marine Fisheries Services Southeast Fisheries Science Center in Beaufort, North Carolina. And I'm going to talk about the incorporation of video into the Southeast Reef Fish Survey, um, a little bit about the methodology of the, of the survey, um, how we've estimated relative abundance with video data, and I'm going to talk about a couple of applied research uh, projects. Um, I want to say before I begin that this work is the result of a whole bunch of people, dozens and dozens of people over the years. Um, it's not just me doing this work. Uh, I'm just the one describing it today. So um, I want to thank everyone for all their contributions over time. And I'm going to have a, a more complete acknowledgement slide at the end. All right here. All right, a quick outline of what I'll be talking about today. So first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history and methodological approach of the Southeast Reef Fish Survey. I'll explain what the Southeast Reef Fish Survey is, the history of it, um, and a bit about the, the methodology of the survey. Secondly, I'm gonna talk about what I'm calling the video trends report from the Southeast Reef Fish Survey. Um, describing some relative abundance patterns for, for a few species. I'm then going to talk about a research project that a variety of, of folks uh, and I were involved in, um, comparing video and, and trap data for um, frequency of occurrence and species richness. And I'm going to end by um, talking about an acoustic telemetry project that describes the fine scale behavior of red snapper around baited traps and, and video. Before I really get into the meat of what I'm, I'm talking about today, I wanna talk a little bit about the reef fish in, um, in our region here along the Southeast Atlantic coast. So there are a number of economically and ecologically important species of reef fish that associate with these um, patches of temperate rocky reefs that are scattered throughout the, um, the continental shelf and the continental shelf break here between North Carolina and Florida's east coast. Um, it's a very biologically diverse community of fish. Um, there are something like uh, over 200 species found in the region. Um, many of these species are long lived um, red snapper is one uh, example of that. They can live to be over 50 years old. Um, some of the species like some of the um, well-known groupers, gag grouper, scamp grouper, snowy grouper, black sea bass, and also red porgy are hermaphroditic, um, mostly um, starting their lives as females and transitioning to males later in life. Um, so there's kind of these unique life history characteristics of the of a lot of fish here in the region. Um, but the main take home message of, of this slide is that um, these reef associated fish species are difficult to observe and especially difficult to sample. You know, the most common sampling approaches for, for fish around the world is by using trawls um, and, and maybe to a lesser extent long lines. But long lines and trawls both are challenging to use in this sort of high relief rocky habitats. So instead, people have turned to things like traps and video cameras to sample fish in these sort of unique habitats. Okay, a bit about the history and methodological approach of the Southeast Reef Fish Survey. So beginning in, I believe it was 1972, the National Marine Fisheries Service began funding South Carolina Department of Natural Resources 
to conduct research and monitoring of reef fish species along the Southeast Atlantic coast. Um, they used a variety of gears over time, um, but uh, starting in the late 1980s, they began using chevron traps shown here in the top right picture um, on this slide. Chevron traps are big kind of arrowhead shaped traps that are baited, fish swim into them, they can't find their way back out. And this became um, um, the sort of central gear used by South Carolina DNR um, in sort of a comprehensive way starting in 1990. So this is a, a comprehensive multi-species reef fish survey that really began in earnest in 1990 and, um, and has continued until today. In 2010, the Southeast Fishery Independent Survey or CFIS program that I'm involved with was created to address a few, th um, three issues. The first is there was a perception that, um, that sample sizes could be increased over this really broad region of about 100,000 square kilometers. Um, and especially in the northern and southern ends of the range. And I'll talk about this a bit more in the next slide. Secondly, um, folks like Eric Williams and Todd Kelson and others suggested adding cameras to traps with the idea being that traps do, do a good job of, of, of catching scavenging and predatory fish species, but there's a lot of other fish species that aren't really attracted to baited fish traps that we could then gain information about from video cameras. And the last point here was applied research. The idea being that we can conduct applied research to try to improve the survey over time. And so now this is a collaborative survey between South Carolina DNR, the CMAP South Atlantic program, which funds um, South Carolina DNR as well, and the National Marine Fisheries Services CFIS program that I work with. And these three programs together are now called the Southeast Reef Fish Survey. So SURFs, I'll, I'll mention SURFs throughout the rest of the talk, and this is the collaborative program that samples for reef fish using identical methods working together to sample um, throughout the South and uh, US South Atlantic region. Okay, a bit about this, the survey expansion that occurred kind of in the early 2010s. So in 2009, um, SCDNR sampled over a really broad area from North Carolina down to, to St. Lucie Inlet in Florida. But there was a perception by some, I think this was especially the case with red snapper, that there wasn't maybe enough sampling happening in the core area where red snapper occurred down off of Cape Canaveral. And there maybe could be more sampling occurring off of North Carolina as well. And so South Carolina DNR as well as CFIS worked really hard um, in the early 2010s, um, oftentimes by talking with fishermen and, um, and fishermen sharing logbooks with us, um, that we really expanded our knowledge of reef fish habitat in North Carolina and Florida. So that in, by 2016, we're sampling a variety of reef habitats from North Carolina's Cape Hatteras down to St. Lucie Inlet in Florida, over a broad expanse of the continental shelf. And we really feel like now that we have a pretty good um, representative sample of reef habitats throughout the region. Okay, a little bit about the methodological approach of the Southeast Reef Fish Survey. So this is a, a simple random sampling design, but the sampling frame or sampling universe is what I showed on the last slide and it was only um, temperate rocky reef habitats that are sampled. So those are the, the target um, habitat type to be sampled in the survey. Um, as I said, chevron traps really began um, in, the chevron trapping began in 1990 and, and has continued through today. Um, in 2010, we began placing video cameras on some traps that were set in the region. And by 2011, all chevron traps deployed by all groups in the region had video cameras attached to them. Sampling occurs during the, uh, the day only. Traps are baited with menhaden and soaked for around 90 minutes. 
And in recent years, in the last um, six or eight years, we've sampled, collaboratively sampled 1,500 to 2,000 um, sites in the region each year over something like 10 or 15 research cruises across all groups. So a, one slide on the fish workup from Chevron traps. So everything caught in traps is counted, um, weighed at the species level, and measured. And um, for priority fish species, we take otoliths for, um, for aging, um, reproductive samples um, to understand more about um, uh, the reproductive biology of these fish. Um, we've taken things like DNA and a variety of other samples over time. So only from the chevron traps are we, um, are we uh, actually gaining this information. Okay, a bit about the video methodology. So um, we use the mean count or sum count, the sort of synonymous sum count approach described in this Showburn paper from 2014. And let me describe it, um, the methods briefly here. So um, once the trap lands on the bottom, we wait 10 minutes to start video reading so that the, so that, um, the fish will kind of settle down around the trap. After 10 minutes of sitting on the bottom, we start counting fish on a series of, of frames across an interval of video. And that interval of video that we read is 20 minutes. And the frames that we count fish on occur every 30 seconds across that 20 minute interval of time, which ends up being 41 frames in total. Mean count is the mean number of fish for a given species across those 41 frames. And the sum count is the sum of those fish across those 41 frames. These traps are baited, so we are attracting fish over some broad area that is unknown. So our assumption is that that unknown area um, is consistent over space and time, um, which is a, a fairly strong assumption. We count on video priority species only. It ends up being just over 100 species or so that we count for mean count or sum count. And all of the other species that we see on video are noted um, as being present or absent over that 20 minute interval of time. So we sort of have two levels of video information here. An abundance data set that is sort of a reduced priority species list and a more complete species list, but presence absence only. And what I'm gonna be talking about the rest of, of this talk is using that abundance or mean count data for the subset of species. Okay, a bit about the study area. So sampling now occurs from Cape Hatteras down to St. Lucie Inlet. Um, and the sampling is, um, goes from about 15 to 115 meters deep. And that's about 50 feet to um, something like 360 or 370 feet deep. The survey occurs from late spring through early fall. And the sampling is spread out over um, the, as much over the study area as possible on each research cruise. It's a total of about 100 or 120 days at sea each year across all the groups that are involved in the survey, um, which is a lot of effort in the region given the, the cost for days at sea. But this is the primary fishery independent survey um, along the Southeast US Atlantic continental shelf. So for those species living on the continental shelf, this is the primary fishery independent data stream used in assessments. There are other data sets included as well, fishery dependent data sets and life history information. But in terms of scientific surveys, this is the, the primary survey included for a variety of assessments. The CFIS program uses the RV Savannah, a contract vessel out of Savannah, Georgia, and the NOAA ship Pisces uh, for their research cruises. And SCDNR uses the RV Palmetto for their research cruises. Okay, so that's sort of the background, a little bit about the methodology. Now I wanna talk about some actual results from the Southeast um, uh, Reef Fish Survey. And I wanna talk a bit about this video trends report. 
So for a number of years, um, SCDNR has produced this really fabulous trap-based trends report that really summarizes indices of abundance or relative abundance information for a for a suite of species that are that are caught fairly well in, in chevron traps. And that's a great resource. I go to it all the time. It's, it's really wonderful. And a number of years ago, Chip and others from the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council have asked CFIS or uh, SERFs to produce a similar video-based trends report. And for a variety of reasons, that didn't happen um, for a number of years. But this year was the first time we actually had the resources and, and the time to, to put that report together. Um, so this year um, we did that. It, it was a collaboration between myself, Brendan Rundy, and Rob Cheshire, and I thank the two of them a lot for their for their help with the coding of that report. And we produced video-based indices of abundance for a total of 18 fish species. We used zero inflated negative binomial models with eight predictor variables, um, which is pretty similar to what has been done for. Um, how we treat video data to be included in CDAR stock assessments. And this report covered a, a time period of 2011 to 2021. Uh, a few really important caveats before I actually show you some of the indices of abundance here. First is that this is not an indication of stock status. That requires a lot of additional information, life history information, mortality rates, um, fishery catches, a lot of additional information that is not being shown here. Um, also, the standardization that we use, this zero inflated negative binomial model, is coded slightly differently than is used for CDAR assessments, mainly in the model selection part of that. I, I, I really included all predictor variables here so that I could do this for a bunch of species fairly easily. Um, but for each assessment, we usually do it um, uh, in a little more specialized or individualized way. So there might be slight differences here, but the differences tend to be pretty slight. And last, the species included here are those for which a video index has been included in a CDAR stock assessment or for species where the, their coefficients of variation, their sort of precision is pretty good. I used a CV of about 0.3 as a cutoff here. So these 18 species um, were selected um, from, for those reasons. Okay, a little bit about a, the background sampling information that went into these indices of abundance. The main take home message here is that the spatial and temporal footprints are pretty similar among years. The depths were pretty similar. The bottom temperatures are pretty similar. And this is good because this is con these things are consistent. We're also controlling for these things in the standardization with the hope being that um, the trends in abundance that you see for these species are not confounded with any changes in the sampling that have taken place. Sampling has been really consistent over space and time. Okay, I'm gonna start out with the bad news first. I'm gonna talk about four species that show sort of declining indices. Um, these figures, show year on the x-axis, the relative video sum count on the y-axis, that's that video count that I was mentioning to you. The relative term means here that, um, that these are standardized to a value of one. And um, the black values are just the mean or nominal values per year. And the red value is that model-based value I was telling you about. Um, the dashed lines are the 95% the confidence intervals. So black sea bass has shown the most precipitous decline out of these 18 species. Um, they've declined a lot. Um, they had some big recruitment years in the late 2000s that drove a pretty high abundance in the early 2010s, but they've declined pretty drastically since that time. Gag grouper were sort of variable in the early 2010s, um, but have uh, been at much lower relative abundance over the last five or six years. Scamp and red porgy have also shown um, declines over the time series. I'll note that their declines haven't been as drastic as black sea bass, probably because they're longer lived species. 
um, than black sea bass. So I think their declines are not happening quite as fast. I want to mention that um, that various folks, um, including Kyle Scherzer and Kevin Craig, are working on a project to understand why recruitment failure has been happening for, for these four, as well as some additional species. Uh, it's interesting that all of these species spawn in the winter time and they all change sex. And so that um, they're trying to understand why these species are showing recruitment failures. And right now it doesn't seem like it's recruitment overfishing or a lionfish predation hypothesis but it does seem like it's something to do with environmental conditions during the winter months. Um, so they're, they're working really hard on that project given the kind of scary um, plots that I'm showing here. Okay, now for some good news. Um, these are, I'm gonna show four examples of species that are increasing. The most notable of course is red snapper. Anyone that spent time out in the water has noticed red snapper abundance increasing over the last decade or so. They've increased quite a lot. Um, and uh, vermilion snapper has also increased over time. They're showing a little more variable pattern. Um, vermilion snapper are a little hard to index because they school so heavily that there's a little more variability around the index. Mutton snapper is a species we didn't used to see very much at all in the early, early 2010s, but have become a lot more common on videos in the last um, five or six years. Almaco jack has also increased in abundance quite, um, quite drastically, um, but have seemed like they declined a little bit um, between 2019 and 2021. I should also mention here, no sampling took place during 2020 because of COVID. So you'll notice these plots are just connecting the dots between 2019 and 2021. The last species I wanna talk about here is um, lionfish. Lionfish has shown some pretty um, big increases from the early 2000s until about 2015 to 2017, but they've actually tapered off a bit since that time. I don't exactly know why that is, um, but uh, the video seems to suggest they're not quite as abundant as they once were. And lionfish is an introduced species in the region. Um, they've been around for, for a, um, a number of decades, but just seemed like they started increasing abundance in the early 2000s. All right, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about a research project comparing um, frequency of occurrence and species richness of various species um, caught in traps compared to seen on videos. So the reason why we're looking at this issue is because there's a lot of um, interest in the optimal methods for surveying reef fish species around the world. And so we were um, looking at a comparison between traps and videos to try to understand more about sort of which gear might be the most optimal for surveying reef fish species. So we looked at frequency of occurrence as well as species richness, and these gears are paired. So this is a very direct comparison of, of video and traps at the same place at the same time. Um, we looked at family level analyses as well as species level analyses. And this, um, we use data over a five year time period where the cameras and the traps, everything was done exactly the same way. And this ended up being just over 7,000 paired samples. And the citation here is a paper that was just published last week on this work. Okay, I wanna show you the family level analyses first. So to orient you to this figure. So first of all, the orange bars here on the right side of the figure show the frequency of occurrence of various families of fish on video. And the dark purple bars here show the frequency of occurrence of various families caught in traps. The green dots here show the percent, is this kind of upper x-axis, is the percent increase of those fish species, or fish families on video compared to traps. So there were 50 families in total that were observed on video. There's, there's some positive values here. You just can't see them because they're so, they're fairly small. Um, 29 of those families were caught in the respective traps. 40 out of the 50 
uh, fish families were observed more often on video than they were caught in traps. Um, and 38 out of the 50, these dotted on uh, these um, dots here, these green dots over on the far right side, were situations where the fish families were observed uh, at least a thousand percent more on video than they were caught in the respective traps. So at a family level, um, the, the video seemed to do a better job of indexing frequency of occurrence than traps. I wanna say that there was one exception here, Batrachoi today, the uh, toad fishes um, were caught in traps in, a, in pretty similar proportion as they were seen on videos. And they happen to be a pretty cryptic species, hard to see on video, and they trap, um, they're attracted to, to bait in the traps. Okay, now the species level analyses. Plot is set up in the same way. So the um, orange bars here on the right are the frequency of occurrence of these various species uh, on video. And the purple bars here are the frequency of occurrence of various species caught in traps. The green dots here either show a percent increase on video if it's right of the zero, or a percent increase in the traps if they're left of the zero. And the 40 species here were selected because of their economic and ecological importance. So there were actually two species, black sea bass and bank sea bass, that were caught in traps more often, significantly more often than they were seen on video. And these fish can enter the traps before we start reading the videos at 10 minutes, maybe after we read the videos after 30 minutes, or during the time we're reading, if they come around the corners of the trap and happen to not be seen on the video. So there are ways of fish getting into trap without being seen on the videos. 36 of the 40 species were seen on video significantly more often than they were caught in traps. And that's most of those with the green dots out here kind of more towards the right. <clears throat> Eight of the 40 species were seen on video but never caught in the traps during this five-year time period. Things like cobia, sand tile fish, African pompano, rainbow runner, goliath grouper, to name a few. Um, I will see that we've caught a number of these species in traps at other times, but for the data set that we used here, they were not included. So again, video overall seems to do a better job of documenting frequency of occurrence but there are some exceptions. Black sea bass and bank sea bass are the most obvious ones. And there's other species like silk snapper here and snowy grouper that are actually caught more often in traps than seen on video, but it just wasn't significant statistically. So traps do a pretty decent job for some species. All right, now um, I wanna look at the relationship between um, species richness in traps, and what I mean that by this is just the number of species caught in traps versus the species richness on video or the, the number of species caught um, or observed on video. And so what we find is that up to about 10 species seen on video, there's a more or less a linear increase of species caught in traps. Um, but at about 30%, 25 or 30% the level of what is seen on video. So for instance, at eight species seen on video, there is a median, the black horizontal thick line here shows the median. There was a median of two species caught in those corresponding traps. After about 10 species seen on video, this relationship sort of plateaued or asymptoted. And so, um, so species richness in traps didn't really increase that much as species richness on videos continued to increase. And so once we get out to 30 species seen on video, we only caught a median of four species in those respective traps. So the take home message here is that video seems to index species richness. It's just more sensitive to species richness and biodiversity than, than traps. And I should also say here that traps really are not designed for this. So it's a little bit, um, I'm sort of fleshing out this relationship here with this figure, but traps were not really designed to index biodiversity in the way that I'm kind of showing it here. So, so just um, keep that caveat in mind. Okay, 
So the take home message from this, um, from this section here is that video seems to assess the presence absence and species richness of various fish families and species better than traps in most instances, but there are some exceptions. Um, but um, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, traps provide really important biological information like otoliths for aging, reproductive tissues to understand reproductive biology, and traps here in our case um, have a much longer, a 20 year longer time series than video cameras. So the trapping information is really important here. Um, I want to say also that um, stereo video provides um, some fish length information. SCDNR and the CFAS program have been collecting stereo video information over the last couple of years. Um, but that length information, while good for things like estimating selectivity, is not as good for understanding age-based information. And of course, our assessments here in the Southeast are mostly age-based. So it's really, lengths from video are really not a replacement for aging structures from otoliths. So really the take home message in my mind, in my personal opinion, is that combining video with a long-term trapping data set and, and trapping um, program is much better than really using either gear alone because it leverages information from both of those gears to improve our understanding of fish in the region. And it was very um, thoughtful of the folks that, um, like Eric Williams and Todd Callison and others, that suggested that cameras be placed on traps instead of replacing the trap survey with a video survey. So it's very, very insightful to do that. Okay, the last I wanna talk about is the fine scale behavior of red snapper around bait. And the reason I wanna, um, I wanna talk about this um, and how this ties into what I've talked about so far is that you know, trap catches and video counts provide relative abundance information but estimating absolute abundance or density of fish over an area would be much stronger and much more useful in assessments. The problem is, is that we don't understand the area of attraction of the bait. So there's a bait plume that travels out in some direction, usually based on the current direction, and fish will smell that and travel to the trap but we don't know the area over which they're, um, they're smelling and responding to those baited fish traps. So um, we've kind of assumed that the bait plume and fish responses are consistent over space and time. We don't really know if that's the case or not. Um, but if we could understand the behavior around bait and quantify that behavior, then we might be able to work towards trying to estimate absolute abundance. But the question really is, how do we quantify fine scale behavior? And this was work that Kyle Scherzer and I from NIMS um, worked with um, Brendan Rundy, Jeff Buckle, and Paul Rudershausen at NC State. So um, we decided that we would try to understand the fine scale behavior of fish around baited traps using acoustic telemetry. So let me tell you a little bit about um, how we did this. So first of all, GPS does not work very well underwater at all. So we can't affix a GPS tag to red snapper and follow them around because they would never be picked up. Um, people often will intern internally surgically implant transmitters or externally uh, attach transmitters to fish and deploy acoustic receivers that will listen for the presence or absence of fish in that area. But that again, doesn't give us the fine scale information that we need for this particular project. So instead we used a system that was developed um, 12 or so years ago called the Vemco positioning system. Vemco is the company that developed this, um, this approach. And let me explain how this works. So first of all, you have to deploy a grid of submersible acoustic receivers that are listening for, for transmitters um, on fish. Uh, you then can tag fish with an acoustic transmitter, release that fish into that study area. And as long as that fish is inside that sort of grid area, um, you can pick up and detect the fish. Every time that fish transmitter um, emits a signal, 
um, a variety of acoustic listening stations will detect that that signal, and it will it will know the exact time that that signal was picked up using time offsets of the time it takes the signal to transmit through water. Um, a bunch of um, mathematicians and, and physicists can then figure out where that fish was in space when it emitted its signal. And they can do this with a really high degree of accuracy and precision, like a one to two meter error rate. So we know exactly where these fish are transmitting from as long as they're in this study system. So let me tell you how we implemented this study system um, to then understand red snapper movements around bait. So this work was conducted in 2019 at, a, um, at this black dot here, east of Cape Lookout, North Carolina, at a place called the Chicken Rock. Um, it's 37 meters deep, so about 125 uh, feet deep. We deployed 20 receivers in a grid pattern, and it's these filled triangles or circles here over this area. This is a multi-beam sonar map in the background. The triangles or filled circles show you where the receivers are. We then um, deployed a reference transmitter in the system, which is this point right here, the circle with an X through it. And that gives us estimates of sound speed velocity. And this is how we estimate the horizontal positional error of the whole system, the whole array. And I'll explain that more in a little bit. Um, there were current probes that were attached to three uh, receivers here, these three triangles. So we got minute by minute water current direction and magnitude information. We tagged 42 red snapper in total, some in May and some in August. We used an external tagging approach because it was really fast and we could get fish back down to the bottom using a descender device really quickly. These fish are dealing with barotrauma injuries so the faster we can get the fish back down to the bottom, the better. These fish range from 390 to 860 millimeters in total length, so a wide range of sizes. This is like three pounds to about 20 pounds. And overall, there were something around 218,000 detections of fish that we knew were alive and swimming around in the study area. So we've excluded, we've censored out um, if the fish um, had lost its tag or had emigrated out of the area. On four different occasions then, May 15th, May 23rd, August 24th, and August 30th, we deployed baited traps in the study area. These traps were not the same as we use in surfs. These were smaller traps with a bait canister here, same bait, Menhaden. We attached GoPro cameras to these traps and the idea here is that we would elicit behavioral responses of red snapper, and we could then um, try to understand the, um, the dynamics of that behavior around, uh, around the baited trap. These were smaller traps. The mouths were closed, so we're not even trying to catch fish in the traps here. We're just trying to understand their behavior around, around the, the baited traps. We then looked at whether these fish responded or didn't respond to these baited fish traps, and we used that as a response variable in a regression modeling approach, and I'll explain that here in a little bit. And then we could relate that to a variety of predictor variables. Okay, so let me first talk about um, how precise these, um, these positions were in space. So date of the study is on the x-axis here, the horizontal positional error in terms of meters is on the y-axis. Um, these are box plots with the thick black line showing the median error rates. We, um, we tagged fish on these two x's, the dates corresponding to the two x's there, and the trapping occurred in these filled circles. Take home message here, the um, horizontal positional error was something like a half a meter to about 1.5 meters over the entire course of the study, which is really high precision and high accuracy. We knew exactly where these fish were when their transmitters were pinging. Okay, so um, there were a whole bunch of responses by telemeter red snapper that I'm gonna summarize in the next couple of slides. 
But for right now, I want to just show you some examples of fish that responded or didn't respond to our baited fish traps. So a couple pictures of fish with the transmitters attached to them. And let me explain how each of these panels is set up. So first of all, our baited fish trap is right in the middle, the, bot, the square with an X through it. The, air, uh, the arrows correspond to the current direction and magnitude in the direction that the current is going. So it's pointing down current. The red snapper are shown by these bubble plots. The white bubbles are when the trap was first deployed and the black bubbles are when the trap was retrieved. So gray is somewhere in between. So the points will get darker and darker as the trap is soaking for longer and longer. Um, the size of the bottle, the bubble, is the, um, the depth of the fish. Fish on the bottom show a bigger bubble. Fish higher up in the water column have a much smaller bubble. And the background is a, a bathymetry map showing the sort of seafloor. And this is a, a 100 meter um, scale bar for reference. So three examples of fish that did not respond to the baited traps. Here's one where the trap went down about 30 meters from a red snapper that was telemetered. And at no point did that fish swim over and um, approach the baited fish trap, which is kind of surprising how close it is. Here's one where the baited fish trap deployed right here. And this red snapper swam around the baited fish trap during the trap soak, including a area down current of the baited fish trap, but at no point approached the trap itself. This third example of, um, is one where the baited fish trap landed right here. This fish was like 60 or 80 meters down current of the baited fish trap, but at no point did that fish swim up and um, spend time next to the trap. Okay, now three examples of fish that um, did find the baited fish trap. So here's one here, the, the trap is a white X um, with a, a square around it here. So this fish was up northwest of the trap by about 100 or 150 meters. But shortly after the trap was deployed, this fish swam directly over to the trap and spent a lot of time around it, went down current of it, and then ended up on this little ledge feature right near the trap. Here's a second example. This trap landed right here. This fish started south. It was moving southeast. I'm guessing it smelled the bait. You can see the arrow here. It did a U-turn and swam right up to the baited fish trap, spent a little bit of time there, and then left and came right back to where it was, and then en ended up kind of in the southeast direction when the trap was retrieved. Here's a third example where the fish was up here as soon as the trap went in the water. The current was south, but this fish somehow knew to swim straight to the trap, hung out there a little bit, and then ended up heading east, and then north, and then back west again around the trap. So that's some examples of fish responding to the baited fish trap. But these examples are a little hard to summarize because they're all sort of so different. And so we tried to summarize this information quantitatively using a generalized additive mixed model. And let me explain how this works. So the main issue here is that we're using a regression modeling approach that relates whether or not individual fish responded to baited fish traps or not, and related that to five predictor variables. The first one is the initial distance between the fish and the trap. We hypothesized that fish closer to the trap when the trap was first deployed would be more likely to respond than fish further away. Second is current direction. This is where the fish is in relation to the, to the trap and the, and the prevailing current direction. We hypothesized that fish in a down current direction would be more likely to respond to the bait than fish up current of the bait and the trap. We also looked at distance off the bottom, hypothesizing that fish further off the bottom would be less likely to respond to baited fish traps because they're less likely to smell the bait. The fourth is recapture period, those four different um, trapping periods I mentioned. And the fifth is the unique tagged fish to account for 
individual fish behavior. And these last two variables were included as random effects in this model. And that's why we had to include um, and use a generalized additive mixed model as opposed to a generalized additive model. Okay, so the summary here. So, try that again. Okay, the top panel here. This is the, um, the y-axis is the probability that telemetered red snapper responded to a baited fish trap. Zero being they never responded, one being they always responded. And the, the first variable here, the initial distance between the fish and the trap was a very important variable in this model. And you can see the results here. Fish were really only had a strong chance of responding to the baited fish traps if they were initially located something like 50 meters from the trap at its deployment. So the take home message here is that we're attracting fish to the baited trap over a pretty small area. Some fish did find the trap from further away, but very few of them did. Most did not. The second variable here, the current direction, we rescaled the current direction so we could look at sort of this kind of circular variable um, up in, in these two, the right and left positions and um, the current down, the fish being downstream of the bait in the middle. And what we found is that um, as hypothesized, fish were more likely to respond from a down current direction than they were in an up current direction. The recapture period and distance off the bottom variables were, were excluded from the model based on AIC. So those variables um, didn't seem to matter. Okay, so we used the two variables that were included, that sort of initial distance between the trap and the fish and the current direction to create a two-dimensional smooth surface over sort of a, an X and Y axis here where current direction is um, uh, moving in a downward direction to look at a response surface of telemeter, telemeter red snapper to bait. So the response probabilities are shown up here in the, in the upper right. And what we see is that fish close to the trap responded strongly, but as we moved away from the trap, it was less and less likely for these fish to respond to the baited trap. And that actually gets um, difficult to estimate an effective fishing area where there's not like a single distance within which all fish responded to the baited fish trap and outside of which none of the fish responded. This was a gradual decline in that response probability. So it's hard to summarize, but one way we try to do it is we use the 50% um, percent response rate circle, which is right here. And within that circle, the area is about 2,290 meters squared. And at least 50% of the fish are responding at that distance. But it gets hard to summarize this otherwise. Okay, so to conclude broadly here over um, all the topics that I talked about. So first, I think video has been a really useful addition to the, the long-term trapping data set from South Carolina DNR um, that is now sort of part of the Southeast Refish Survey. Um, traps do a great job of indexing abundance for a handful of species. Video um, can do that for a, a little bit larger subset of species. And there's a lot of overlap between the two where species have both a trap and a video index included in their CDAR stock assessment. Um, and oftentimes those indices correspond very closely, which is also reassuring. So I think combining video and traps um, in this sort of large scale survey is better than using, is much better than using either gear alone, um, even despite the additional resources it takes to have this kind of multi-gear survey. Um, relative abundance is being indexed well for a, a number of species, probably 20 or 25 species now, where CVs are something like less than 0.2 or 0.3, which is, which is really great. <laughs> um, I think fine scale telemetry was a really useful approach to understand the fine scale behavior of fish around baited gears. 
Um, it really helped us understand the area over which red snapper were, were traveling to approach these baited fish traps. And I want to end with um, talking a little bit about the large scale project um, headed by Will Patterson to estimate red snapper absolute abundance here in the along the US South Atlantic um, coast. Um, one of the one of the main approaches that that project is using is the surfs trap and video data combined with some ROV surveys and some information from this fine scale telemetry study to try to estimate red snapper absolute abundance. I want to thank a whole bunch of people that have been involved in, um, in this collaborative survey in a variety of different ways. So I want to first thank CFIS folks, Zach, Kevin, Aaron, Christina, Zeb, and Brad for all of their help over the years, both in the field and video reading. Roldan has also helped in the, in, um, in the field and reading videos. There have been a bunch of other video readers over time, including some folks at SCDNR, and I thank them. Um, previous CFIS members for all of their help. Todd Callison was the really the, the linchpin in starting this um, uh, surf survey, the CFIS component of the surf survey, and has been really great um, over the years in providing support for this. Kevin Craig is the current supervisor of CFIS, and I thank him for all of his support as well. Uh, we work really closely with SCDNR. Um, it's a great working relationship. Wally and Tracy and all the other folks at, um, at MarMap, including all the cruise participants on CFIS and MarMap cruises, all the lab work, which is a lot of work um, reading otoliths and, and reproductive tissues, and the various folks dealing with the data management between these kind of two different groups. Also like to thank the captains and crews of all the vessels we've worked on over time. It's a huge effort to conduct the field work annually, and I want to thank everyone for that. Um, I think our, our uh, collaborative surveys have taken out probably hundreds of cruise volunteers at this point. I thank them for all their help. Um, research collaborators, I'd say especially Jeff Buckle over time for all of his hard work um, in trying to understand more about um, traps and video gears in the region. And the various industry partners, most notably helping us um, uh, discover new reef habitats in North Carolina and Florida to be included in, in the surf sampling, um, but also industry partners um, in, um, in projects like the Red Snapper Telemetry Project. They were very helpful in helping us at catch and tag um, fish for, for various projects. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. And I'll also say that um, anyone feel free to email me anytime with all, any questions as well as if you don't want to chime in here today. But it looks like we have about 35 minutes for in-person um, questions if you'd like to ask them now. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. I'm going to take back over control real quick. Um, just once again to uh, show everybody on how to do the how to operate the webinar. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, click on this icon that kind of is supposed to represent a hand raised. Um, for everyone, I think it is green right now. Um, but if you'd like to click on that, your hand will turn red. Indicate that you have your hand raised. After that, um, I'll put you in the queue to speak. Uh, then you'll need to click on this micro, uh, red microphone. Make sure it turns green. That'll give you the ability to speak. And then if you'd like to enter it into the question box, you can do, do so down here at the uh, bottom of your control panel. If you add some questions into the chat box, um, the, the group won't be able to see that, so I'll have to read them out loud for you. With that, uh, the first question is from uh, Brendan. Brendan, you're unmuted. Hey, Nate. Great. Hey, Nate, hope you can hear me. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, just wanted to know if you envision any sort of future in which uh, either going forward or looking backward or both, the non-priority species on the videos are uh, counted instead of just noted for presence absence. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question, Brendan. So um, um, from 2010 until 2014, we only counted fish, um, priority fish species using that mean count approach. We didn't record the presence or absence of any of the additional species up to that point. But um, 
Well, we decided to do that in 2015. It also happened to correspond with a, a sort of a new camera refresh in our program. And so we began in, including that presence absence information for additional species. And the thinking was that it wouldn't um, take us uh, too much additional time to do that since it was just presence absence. The downside, of course, is that we're not getting abundance information. We're getting distribution information for those species, but not abundance information. Um, the challenge right now is, um, you know, these videos can take a fair amount of time to read, as I'm sure Cephas folks um, are probably going to ask, chime in here and, and say, um, some videos can take many days to read if they're really fishy. Um, we have six full-time video readers with a, a little bit of additional help from Roldan and others. Um, and we're only able to read using the, the methodological approach I, I shared today, only about 75% of the videos that we collect. So about 500 videos we collected in 2021 have not been read yet because we just don't have the resources to do that. So I think if we're able to hire more people, we could read more of the videos. Um, and then of course we could include mean count for additional species if we had additional video reading effort as well. All right, thank you for the question, Brendan. Any other questions? Matt, I see you have your hand raised. You go ahead and unmute yourself. There you go. Hey, Nate, it's your neighbor, Matt. How you doing? Good, how you doing, Matt? Good. I uh, had a question about the work you did with Brendan and Rob to standardize those video indices. I was wondering if you could um, go back and let me know what the covariates were that you used to standardize those specifically um, for black sea bass, which I notice in the sum count has uh, something of a bump in 2015, which I believe was when you switched camera types. So I, I'm basically trying to get at how you were able to uh, smooth that, uh, that catchability impact out. Yeah, let me first mention, Matt, that um, we performed a pretty extensive camera calibration in 2014 where we had our old cameras side by side with new cameras looking in the same direction. Uh, I think we collected something like 100 or 120 of those side by side videos. Um, we then read those videos at exactly the same time, um, like the same frames. So it was literally a direct um, calibration between the two cameras. And we came up with a, a, a calibration factor for black sea bass that, if I remember correctly, was a pretty strong, tight relationship. So we first calibrated the two cameras and that camera switch that occurred in, in 2015. Secondly, um, in terms of the predictive variables that are included in the model, I think I could rattle off most. I might be able to get all of them. Um, we include water clarity, um, which is a qualitative score, fair, um, uh, poor, fair, and good, um, based on whether we can see the horizon or see the structure on the bottom. We um, look at the current direction. We, we standardize for current direction, as you know. Um, when the current is, is um, moving away from the camera that we use to read videos, the fish aggregate on that down current side, and we tend to count many more fish than if the camera was looking up current. So we standardize for that current variable. Um, we included latitude, depth, season, substrate, which is a measure of a hard bottom on the bottom, uh, water temperature, and year. I think those might be the those might be the eight variables that we included in that in that model, Matt. Um, but yeah, um, most of the other species didn't really show the bump in um, you know between 2014 and 2015, suggesting that. Um, you know, the camera switch didn't really have an effect on the indices of abundance, which is good. You know, I'd be kind of curious to know if there was a little bit of a, a recruitment pulse that might have happened where fish were recruiting to the video gears in 2015. Maybe could explain that little bit of a bump up. Um, but it is a little bump <laughs> compared to some of the recruitment pulses that happened a decade earlier. Um, it would be pretty small. Thanks for your question, Matt. 
All right. So the next question it was uh, entered into the question box. It was from Dave Wyansky. He said, nice presentation. Was time of day of trap deployment evaluated as a potential, uh, potential predictor variable in the telemetry study? It was not, Dave. Um, you know, there were a number of things that varied um, amongst the four recapture periods or within each of the recapture periods. So it was for kind of four daytime trappings. We included that sort of recapture period variable with the idea being that we could use it to, um, to deal with any um, changes amongst those um, four recapture periods in terms of environmental conditions, moon phase, water temperature, or other things um, without actually having good measures of those things because it would really only be a sample size of four. So that recapture period was included to try to account for some of that. That variable fell out of the model. It didn't seem like there was a lot of day-to-day -day variability in the, um, whether or not telemetered red snapper would be attracted to the baited traps. Your, um, uh, your question specifically about time of day is a really good one. We didn't look at that in this study. You know, I've looked at it some for um, surfs trapping data, um, and it does seem like for some species, there might be a little bit of a time of day effect. You know, we start trapping in the, as Dave knows very well, um, we start trapping, you know, pretty early in the morning and end before sunset in the evening. And some species, like maybe those crepuscular feeding species, maybe are more likely to be trapped in the, you know, the morning or the, um, the last set um, in the, you know, in the late afternoon or early evening, um, then during the middle of the day. But there's so much variability in trap catches, just like there was a lot of variability in the red snapper approaches, that it's pretty hard to disentangle a time of day effect on the data. My guess is if I if I tried to include that for the red snapper data set, it wouldn't it wouldn't come out as significant just because like it's just really highly variable. It was like some fish decided to respond to these traps and some didn't. Some spent five minutes, some spent the entire time period, some found it, left, came back to it, left, came back to it. They just did all sorts of um, different things around the trap. So it was kind of hard to generalize it actually. And a lot of variables ended up not being significant. I think because of the variability in the, in the response behaviors of the fish. Great question. All right, Nick has his hand raised. Yeah. Hey Nate, uh, my name is Nick Smiley from the South Atlantic Council. Uh, really interesting okay. presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. I've got a super technical question for you. What was the craziest thing that y'all saw on these videos, you think? Well, first of all, I wish the other Cephas folks were online and could chime in here because they're the ones reading all the videos, not me. So um, they've shared some cool videos with me over time. So I've seen a few neat things, some of which I showed um, in the presentation. Um, there's a few things that come to mind. Um, uh, one is, you know, we've seen some cleaning behavior of various fish. One was kind of a cool one where we had an, I think it's the ocean, only ocean sunfish I've ever seen on a video, swam in and it actually had some sort of fish, and I can't even remember what it was now, it was a number of years ago, was sort of cleaning it for a little while, which is kind of crazy. There was another one that um, Christina Showburn found where there was a small black fin snapper that was swimming over sand. And in a split second, the blackfin snapper disappeared. And if you slowed it down to look at that video, literally frame by frame, because it all happened so quickly, over the course of like two or three frames, there was, a, I think, she's gonna probably correct me if I'm wrong here, some type of snake eel or another type of eel that came out of the sand, grabbed the blackfin snapper, and pulled it right back down into the sand and ate it. Um, that's kind of hard to beat. You said, you know, we see a lot of cool species, you know, we've seen great white sharks and sea turtles and dolphins and all sorts of cool fish behavior. Um, one other neat one that comes to mind is, um, I haven't been able to refine this because I didn't take notes when I saw it, which is a big oversight. 
but it was a school of Atlantic cutlass fish or ribbon fish. And they were all swimming by the trap, but kind of like in this sort of position. Like I would have thought they swim kind of horizontally, but they didn't. They were coming by like this, which was wild to see. And it was a whole school of them. So, so that was pretty cool too. But I wish that Cephas folks could chime in here. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and they're more than welcome to. They can uh, just raise their hand and they'll be unmuted to, to speak. Go ahead, Cephas, if you want to chime in. All right, Brad Tier. Good. Hey guys, Brad Tier, uh, work with Cephas. Um, yeah, Nate mentioned a lot of the biological, but I think also seeing some of the, uh, we've seen shipwrecks and there's big debate if there's a cannon on one video. <laughs> um so those stick out to me and yeah yeah like uh i remember a turtle scratching his back on top of the trap um <laughs> and some other behaviors that are uh yeah it's it's been great over the years to see all the videos that's a great point brad glad you brought that up all right the next question was entered in the question box from joe hightower can you describe the relative <laughs> usefulness of a uh, fixed video on traps with lots of double counting versus one pass ROV transects? Man, great question, Joe. So, you know, I think there's pros and cons to, to, to each of those um, sampling gears. You know, ROV can be really good for some species that don't move around as much, um, you know, maybe are some slightly more cryptic than we could see on stationary cameras like we use. Um, but are probably not as good for some of the strong swimming, really heavily scavenging or predatory fish. Um, amberjack, like is shown in the, the question slide here, comes to mind. They swim so fast and they're so curious that trying to estimate their abundance from the sort of transect approach you get from an ROV can be really difficult. Um, the downsides of a fixed camera like we use on our, on our traps is that we miss a lot of small sort of cryptic species. We also tend to attract more predatory or scavenging fish species and other fish species like, you know, other sort of coral reef things like butterfly fish and damselfish, um, uh, angelfish, things like that um, are, are not interested in the trap. And so there's can be like a difference in behavior where attracting some species and not attracting others. And so there can be a um, challenges when interpreting the, the relative abundance among species because of that. Um, you know, we looked at a, um, a, a variety of people, including Brad Tier, Todd Kellison and others were involved in a study in 2014 where Chevron traps were deployed with cameras and then divers immediately descended and, um, and uh, counted fish over transects right around the baited fish trap. And it was a really illuminating study because there were fish species like some big sharks that the divers didn't see at all. But the, the sharks were such strong swimmers, they came in and checked out the bait a little bit. I, I recall a big bull shark on one of those videos that the divers didn't see. But the divers are seeing all these small cryptic things, a lot like an ROV would see, um, that the fixed stationary camera didn't see. So there was something like, um, you know, 25 species that the divers saw that the that the our fixed cameras didn't. But there was like 15 species our fixed cameras saw that the divers didn't. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of overlap in what those gears are seeing but there's some species that are seen by one gear and some species seen by another gear that they're, you know, that are not shared. So, you know, I feel like there's pros and cons of each of these sampling gears. And by combining gears like we kind of do in surfs, I think you can kind of understand some of those um, potential issues because you know when a fish is on a video. And so then you can see whether it and enters a trap and relate that to environmental conditions or habitat or, or other things like that. So it's a, it's a great question. It's hard to kind of get at it, but I think by combining gears um, is the best way to do that. And I'll maybe say one last thing is, 
Um, in the, the, the big project to estimate red snapper abundance in the US South Atlantic, um, there are, there's paired sampling that is occurring now with um, Will Patterson's ROV group um, doing transects with an ROV. And then we're sampling with our traps and video cameras right after that occurs. And so we're gonna have a big comprehensive data set with ROV data, fixed camera data, and trap data from, from particular places all along the, the South Atlantic coast. So maybe in a, another year or two, we'll be able to answer your question a little more completely. Thanks, Joe. All right, Kathleen has her hand raised. Hi, Nate, Kathleen Howington, CDAR. <laughs> Hi, Kathleen. Um, so this is kind of a follow-up to Nick's question, but it also is something that came up at the CDAR 82 Great Triggerfish workshop. Mm -hmm. Do y'all have a system for identifying unique behaviors? For example, like nesting or mating, courting, changing colors, stuff like that, that could then like be cross-referenced with species that are present to try and like get clips and videos of these behaviors? Yeah, I wish um, Christina or Brad, maybe they can chime in because they know the protocol a little better than me, but anytime those kind of unique behaviors, unique species associations, uh, nesting behavior, things like that. Um, another thing that comes to mind is like the black belly behavior of a gag grouper. Um, those things are noted in our video database, like in a comment section. So we can query that um, to pull up those video instances where those behaviors or particular things are seen. So um, I don't know how comprehensive that is. Um, so other people might need to chime in to to say that, but yes, those things are generally noted in the video database. Yep, great, great point. All right, any other questions? Oh, Kathleen, your hand is up again. So this is actually my original question before Nick asked yeah. his, um, and I might've just missed this during your presentation, so I apologize, but. I think I remember something about in Florida trying to get length data from these cameras. I understand that you would need like a stereo camera system. Is there like a way, a timeline on trying to get length or are y'all working on that right now? Where where are we in the process of hopefully getting those? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll try and describe it. Um, Wally might, or Ted Switzer, if he's on the call, might need to, they know a little bit better than me, but um, CFIS began using a, a limited number of stereo video cameras in 2018. And that ramped up a little bit in 2019, so that we had, I think we collected something like 150 stereo videos. So it was more or less one out of every six traps, Kathleen, had a stereo video camera on it, and we were reading those for, uh, for fish lengths. Um, um, South Carolina DNR, the state of Florida, put in a, a, a proposal to expand that work. Um, uh, kind of coastwide work with the state of Florida um, to do more of that stereo video work. That was funded, and I believe in 2021, or maybe it started in 2022, Wally would have to correct me on that. Um, there's now ramped up effort. So both groups, South Carolina DNR and CFIS, is um, using some amount of stereo video cameras on traps throughout the region. We haven't fully moved to stereo cameras exclusively, but they're being used on more, on a, a larger and larger proportion of traps. Um, with the idea being that we can get better estimates of trap and video selectivity from that information. So that work is expanding. I think it's gonna occur over the next uh, number of years, maybe another year or two or three. Um, and then I imagine there's gonna be a, a large report that is trying to estimate trap and video selectivities. It's a big collaborative project. It's great. So thank you. I think it'll be helpful to estimate selectivity. Any other questions? Myra? Hi, uh, hi Nate, this is Myra, South Atlantic Council hi. staff. Um, just curious, you I think you said you're seeing more 
button snapper um, in the survey. And I know the survey only goes as far south as the Cape, I believe, Cape Canaveral. So it, do you think this might be an indication of a, a shift in abundance or their, their distribution rather, or, or range expansion? Is, is there any, you all looked into that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Myra. So, um, so we sample a little bit further than uh, south in Cape Canaveral, down to about St. Lucie Inlet, which is just north of sort of Jupiter, kind of at about Stewart, Florida. So we get pretty far south, but certainly we're not sampling down into the Keys at all. <laughs> um, so, you know, where, where mutton snapper are historically more commonly observed. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know about the historical range of mutton snapper at all. Um, you know, there's a really famous fish market here in Moorhead City, uh, sanitary fish market, and they have a taxidermy mutton snapper um, over the entrance of the restaurant, which is pretty interesting being here in, in Moorhead City, North Carolina. And we've seen more and more mutton snappers show up in North Carolina, you know, whereas 10 years ago, we never really never saw them in North Carolina. So my guess is that their abundance is increasing and their abundance as it's increasing, it's probably increasing their distribution as well. The other point I wanna make here is that almost across the board, all snapper species have been increasing. I didn't show gray snapper. They're the ones that showed, a, a they're, they're showing a little bit of an uptick in the last couple of years, but pretty um, even before that. Um, but lane snapper are increasing as well. So why is it that almost across the board, snappers are increasing in abundance? And almost across the board, groupers have been decreasing in abundance is, is, um, is beyond me. I don't know why it is. Um, but like I said, that you know, folks are trying to understand this low recruitment issue with a number of uh, winter spawning species. And these snappers are spawning mostly in the summertime. So I don't know if it has something to do with you know, summertime conditions of, of spawning or, or what, but... Um, yeah, mountain snapper is an interesting one. They're definitely becoming more abundant in the area that we're sampling. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions, so I'll jump in with a question. Yeah. I was just wondering, in some of the past CDARs, they used uh, Stevens and McCall uh, to do species assemblage in order to determine zero trips that are, are to get uh, the possibility of zeros for individual species. And I'm wondering if what you're seeing here as far as species assemblage could be a better replacement to what's observed coming back to the dock and get more at, you know, species associations. Mm, yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. I'd be curious to know what, you know, Kevin Craig and, and Kyle Schertzer and, and Eric Williams think about, think about that approach. Um, I think it's certainly possible. You know, I worry a little bit about species that have declined a lot, like scamp. You know, scamp were pretty widely distributed, and and you know we still see them, but you know I I we're just seeing them so less frequently than we used to see them that I I worry a little bit about um, looking at a kind of a static spatial distribution of fish right now and making inferences about what it used to be because of you know species range contractions or range expansions but um but maybe if you could account for some of those types of things that 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 might be possible thank you yeah. any other questions you can type them into the box or raise your hand All right, I'm not seeing any other. So we really appreciate your time today and as well as the rest of the team with, within NIMPS and within South Carolina DNR to work on these this project. I think it's been uh, very useful for the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council to inform management and science in the region. So uh, thank you and the rest of the team for this. Thank you, Chip, for the invitation. And thank, thanks everyone for joining. This is great, appreciate it. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.